Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to share with you today some, some results of a very long, multi-year, a really, truly interdisciplinary collaboration with countless collaborators. So here I just acknowledge a short list of main contributors. Um, believe me, uh, plastic pollution uh, is now uh, almost... <laughs> it's, it's so serious, it's so... Uh, ubiquitous. Uh, it's seen by so many people. Uh, you don't need... Uh, this uh, photo photograph was taken in Indonesia, but you don't need to travel to Indonesia to see it. Just walk across the road of this beautiful resort, and on the beach you, you, you will find, you know, you will find all the evidence that you may need. Uh, you will see some local debris, you, you, you may see some debris, that, uh, some plastic that probably came from nearby countries, from mainland Europe and North Africa. And you will see fragments, nice colorful fragments, particles of plastic that was probably in water for a long time, so-called microplastic. And also, if you look carefully, you, you will see large number of these spheres, which are pre-production pellets. This is how uh, plastic is manufactured originally and then transported to the plants where it's actually shaped into uh, useful items. So why, why plastic became such a problem? Um, you know, plastic material, it's, it's a beautiful material. It's, it was genius invention of uh, mankind and uh, in the beginning it was... It was really positive, really good material. M maybe some of you remember it was saving trees. Uh, and uh, it has uh, fantastic properties. It allows to easily, uh, easy manufacturing, easy to, to change shape, and also it offers so broad range of properties that uh, it's actually used in every aspect of our life, everywhere. Uh, also, it's fantastically cheap. Um, and, uh, and because of this low cost, it actually helped to improve life level of most poor countries, most poor people. And then it's durable. Uh, we don't want you know, uh, our favorite items to fall apart soon, so uh, we, like, we like things that are kind of hard. But for exactly the same reasons, we, uh, we are getting kind of backfire from, from these properties. So because, because of its usefulness, it's now everywhere, and it approaches all possible points of uh, entry points into our environment because of low cost, Economically, it's not feasible, it's not profitable to, you know, to track this, um, uh, this plastic. It's much cheaper just to produce more, to produce new one. So uh, most of companies working on recycling and most of cleanup groups, they are uh, generous people doing, you know, their, contributing their, their effort to uh, sustaining our uh, uh, environment. And then it's durable, but this means it lasts well beyond its useful life. So after it's used, it's out of sight, and then that is when it uh, gets out of control, and uh, uh, because uh, it has so long time uh, out of control, it can actually travel, slowly travel all around the planet. And that's why it's now found uh, basically everywhere. Uh, so, uh, what is what is the source of, of plastic? Of course, of course, it's uh, based on uh, currently it's based on uh, oil production, and oil production is now huge. Uh, in 2009, uh, it reached 4.2 billion uh, metric tons, uh, and 10% of uh, oil is generally converted into into the plastic. And oil production uh, grows exponentially. Uh, there is no uh, expected saturation in the near future. Uh, Jenna Jembeck and uh, collaborators, they did nice work trying to uh, pull together different data and trying to estimate, uh, to estimate the amount of plastic that can sneak into our oceans. And uh, they took into account all coastal countries, and colors here showed uh, 
relative contributions of different of various countries, uh, and uh, so they listed also main contributors, and you can see now uh, China is number one, and U United States are still visible despite of effort of many people. And uh, this table is going to change in the next five, ten years because of uh, growing, uh, new growing economies and uh, 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 increased production uh, and, and uh, consumption of plastic in developing countries. Um, so uh, they estimated that uh, 275 million metric tons of plastic was generated in coastal countries in 2010, out of which between 5 and 13 million tons could enter the ocean. Uh, this number is very difficult to, uh, to verify. It, it's, it looks a little bit like estimating probability of life of some remote, in some remote galaxy, because it's based on uh, you know, many, many assumptions. But at least each assumption can be tested, it can be improved, and then numbers can be improved. And this number can be easily uh, somewhat uh, overestimate, uh, an overestimate, but, and, and they suggest that with years, it actually will grow exponentially following exponential growth in oil production. But this number can be also an underestimate, because one of the assumptions is they take into account population living only in uh, 50 kilometers uh, of coastline. But uh, some people, such uh, like uh, Doug Woodring, uh, they suggest that no, you don't need to, to live on, on the shoreline to pollute the ocean. Wherever you are, you just throw away your PET bottle and wind and rain can take it into a local stream and then stream will join bigger river and river will end in the ocean. So they suggest that actually coastline is entire watershed. And this is one part of the problem. We all contribute to plastic pollution of the ocean no matter where we live. Uh, and there are additional, uh, additional less understood sources, sea-based uh, sources such as a huge number of fishing nets that are lost uh, in normal activity or abandoned uh, and uh, continue fishing and then finally end uh, on some shores. And then cargo containers. I don't know recent numbers, but uh, like five years ago, believe it or not, there were about 10,000 marine cargo containers lost at sea during storms. And it sounds like a huge number, but if you compare with you know size of modern uh, cargo ships, it's it's not that big. It's uh, not most noticeable in, in the general statistics. And once in water, uh, behavior of this if impact of these containers, it depends on what is inside. They may be sinking down, they may be opening, they may be floating and, and uh, causing damage to uh, 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 boats and ships, as maybe you, you saw in some Hollywood movie. Uh, and then uh, cruise liners, recreational activity, uh, they, they uh, add their share to the problem. So, uh, okay, once, once in the ocean, what can we tell about the pathways? How, um, how plastic, how marine uh, debris, how, how does it move? Uh, to answer, to give the full answer, we would need to, crack, uh, to track many different types or attach transmitters and follow with, with satellites. For now, we cannot do this. So, easy way to uh, kind of produce some kind of concept is to use available already available scientific data of satellite-tracked drifting buoys. And uh, probably most of you already know uh, this, um, uh, these buoys are used starting from 1970s. Uh, uh, they were used in Toga Corps, in WOS, and now uh, they are part of uh, global drifter program. And uh, they, were, uh, they were originally designed just to follow water uh, below diurnal uh, a diurnal mixed layer. Uh, they have large drogue uh, centered at approximately 15 meters depth, so this is not exactly surface uh, scientific debris, it's uh, more measuring subsurface. And uh, they also measure SST, which is uh, important contribution to weather forecast and uh, climate studies. So, um, 
And uh, just by looking at its design, you can see that basically we can make analogy to some types of debris, like fishing gear, uh, fishing nets, uh, or microplastic, which actually, because of its very weak buoyancy, it mixes down even by weak wind. So it's, it does not stay on the surface. It travels kind of in the layer, which, is, which may be corresponding to, to the range of... Um, uh, of uh, drifters. And uh, at every moment, we have between 13 and 1400 drifters. You can see this map. And uh, this is impressive coverage, but then, of course, you see uh, large gaps. And um, so, a simple way how to use this gappy, sparse data set is uh, we just combine together all historical data, 20,000 trajectories. Uh, that uh, they cover pretty nicely, pretty densely, the entire uh, ocean. And then we assume that uh, statistics of uh, motion of drifters, it does not change much with time. So we split trajectories on, in this case, five-day five day short segments. And we use these segments to uh, estimate probability of drifter travel between relatively small beans, half degree. And then uh, this statistics is, is a function of location. Um, and then we can, we can run this statistical model from any initial condition, and then we can run it as long as we want. And I will try to play this movie. So uh, here we start with um, uniform, uniform initial density of particles. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky, sorry. Um, uniform initial density, and then you can see how one year later uh, particles are pushed away from some areas of well-known divergences like equatorial areas and also uh, western boundaries of currents, uh, up basically upwelling areas. And then if we continue, then As time goes, in three years, uh, our model particles, they collect mostly in the subtropics, and tropics and high latitudes are uh, kind of free from our particles, more or less. And then if we continue further, <coughs> then in 10 years, Particles concentrate in relatively small areas. These areas are known as garbage patches. These areas are known as uh, areas where uh, observation detect higher concentration of uh, uh, microplastic. And I, I will talk about it a little bit later. So what happens if we continue this, uh, this model for a long time, for 1,000 years? So uh, again, this model, it It, it lacks many uh, important processes. It lacks degradation of particles. The only way how particle can be removed from the ocean, in this case, is when drifter goes on shore. So the only dissipation mechanism is lateral mixing and then uh, entering, uh, uh, hitting the shore, the coastline. But uh, this, um, just by comparing these uh, two mechanisms, surface convergence versus uh, mixing, uh, we, can, uh, we can estimate uh, the robustness uh, of these garbage patches. And when we run it for 1,000 years, then you can see how some garbage patches disappear, but two are still there this one and this one. So uh, here, convergences are amazingly, amazingly robust. And uh, three-tenths means uh, 30% of trace is still here, and 70% is still, is still in this jail. Um, when we run the same experiment, but under more realistic sources, like uh, sources from coastline proportional to uh, density of population or uh, consumption of plastic, then we get more realistic amplitudes. And now you see that uh, concentration is the highest uh, of microplastics, is highest in the North Pacific. It's comparably high in, in the North Atlantic and South Atlantic. And by the time when we produced these simulations, actually only these two 
were known. And these three were not known. There was a notion that the southern hemisphere is fortunately still pure and free from plastic influence. And in collaboration with uh, uh, Marcus Ericsson and, and Jim McKay, they spent time, months and years at sea. They, they actually used our model as a guidance and they sailed into these garbage pages and they confirmed that when, when you cross, when you go across, you kind of can, uh, uh, can observe this maximum at uh, predicted locations. Uh, so uh, this kind of, this helps to, to, to reveal the problem, but sometimes we overshoot. For example, every time when uh, we publish a map like this of instantaneous today's location of garbage patch, not today's at that time. Uh, so uh, sometimes we receive questions, okay, hey guys, uh, this summer I'm going to sail and I want to find this plastic island or garbage island. And the first time when I was asked, I was kind of offended. I thought they are talking about Hawaii. But uh, then, uh, indeed, many people believe uh, this concentration is so high, you just cannot miss it, you can walk on it. But uh, uh, reality is, when you go there and you try to, to take observations, this picture is taken from, from a bridge of cargo ship. So when you take observations, then you need to spend time to find these tiny objects that are floating. And this is uh, the case when concentration is really high. Uh, in most cases, you really need to pull a troll over miles so that you find, you find uh, enough particles for your, for your analysis. But given the huge, vast area of the ocean, the total, the integral, it's, it's uh, really, really impressive. Um, and also, uh, this, on this map you can see here is the location of Hawaii, where I'm from. So uh, this is garbage patch, and because in reality, uh, due to seasonal cycle and interannual variability, it's kind of wobbling and moving and shrinking and expanding, time to time it spills uh, its content on uh, our shores, and this is what it looks, how it looks in different areas. Um, okay, uh, so um, how well do we understand uh, mass balance of this apparent, apparent problem? Um, life cycle of um, plastic uh, in, the, in, in the ocean, including land and, and um, uh, atmosphere and polar seas and Arctic, Antarctic, uh, Antarctica, uh, it's, it's really complex. Uh, this schematic of life, uh, life cycle is really, you know, a simplification. And uh, many processes included uh, in, this, in this schematic, uh, they are just uh, detected and they are proven on a level of concept. They are not quantified, they are not really understood, they are not, their relation to various control parameters is not, uh, not, not proven. So, uh, if we uh, try to focus on something that we think is most significant, for example, coastline, this is where most of our observations are. This is the best known part. So, what, what part of, of the problem we can see from the coastline? So, if uh, from, from the study of uh, Jenna Jembeck that I showed before, if you add together all contributions of all the countries, then uh, roughly you can estimate uh, 8 million tons uh, uh, of plastic is added into global ocean every year. That estimate is for uh, 2010, but uh, order of magnitude, I think it's still valid. Uh, 8 million metric tons per year. Uh, if we compare how much uh, plastic is removed from, from the ocean by international coastal cleanup. And international coastal uh, cleanup, it's, it's a huge community. It includes more than half a million people, really active, really good people, working really hard. Uh, and then if you take the last year report and add together, it's uh, frustratingly only 8,000 tons. So it's one-tenth of a percent. Uh, we are missing 99.9% of, of plastic that we don't know about. But, okay, is it, is it important? It, it was obvious, right? Because we just saw that this uh, 
debris, it starts from coastline, it converges into subtropics, it stays there for a long time. Some, some people, uh, some chemists estimate polymers uh, can, can last for hundreds of years. Uh, and so this is where it must be hiding. Uh, but uh, then other study by uh, Eric van Sebiel that compares modeling with uh, sparse observational data, then it gives very coarse estimate of the total, uh, and in this case, wind effect is corrected and other biases are corrected, and uh, ac uh, accuracy of total estimate is relatively low, but this is order of magnitude. So even in, uh, in the um, worst case scenario, in th uh, the most daring estimates, it's about 3% of one year balance. So we hugely lack uh, the 99% um, uh, of the mass of plastic pollution. We don't know where it is. And every time when we try to guess where it can be, where it can be, there are many guesses. This is very short list. Uh, it can be extended for several slides. Uh, remote areas, so areas where it's not seen on the shoreline, uh, such as Alaska or uh, sinking down to ocean bottoms, or ocean bottom, or buried in different types of uh, beaches, or decaying under influence, fast decaying under influence of UV more faster than uh, chemists expected, and also uh, effect of uh, microbes and bacteria that was uh, that is really hard to prove, but there are some evidences, and also uh, other kinds, other types of biological interactions. So you just take one, any of them, and you will find proof. This is, all of them are, are, are true. And um, uh, there are many more unknown, unknown things. And here is just example, here is Alaska. If you don't know, uh, Alaskan coastline, uh, uh, it uh, actually more than half of the entire US coastline. But the population of Alaska is a little bit over 2 million people living in some uh, relatively small areas. So most of the coastline, it's not monitored, it's not cleaned. And uh, I must say uh, what I know from friends in Alaska, it's clogged, uh, mainly with fishing gear. Uh, and uh, these styrofoam uh, fishing floats, uh, they travel as far as from uh, China seas, South China Sea, East China Sea, and you see this number of PET bottles. There is nobody to drink water in those areas. And then um, uh, these groups of uh, cleanup, they organize campaigns every summer, and summer is very short, uh, about three months when uh, you can work there, and then they need boats and helicopters, and they need to live on boats because of bears. And then uh, it becomes understandable why in other areas, the amount of cleaned plastic is measured by bags or by kilograms, but in Alaska, it's measured by millions of dollars spent on the cleanup. And that's partly why plastic is cheap, because this price is not included into his, into his cost. Um, and the uh, problem in Alaska uh, does not stop on the shoreline. After summer ends, in winter, uh, winds are very strong, and they blow uh, plastic inland. And after that, it's nearly impossible to recover it. Um, speaking about being buried in, in beaches, we just went out to Big Island of Hawaii, and five males were digging for a full day into a rocky beach. And what we found was kind of amazing. Uh, on the top, on the, uh, on the surface originally, we saw some plastic, but not that much, but after removing some rocks, surface layer of, of rocks, here is what we saw, so we, we kept digging, and by the sunset we reached depth about one meter, and after coming back to the university and counting everything, we estimated from one cubic meter of the beach, we recovered about 10 kilograms of plastic fragments, 10 kilograms from this small spot. And if you multiply by the length of coastline and project on other places, which is ris a risky thing to do, it can be, it can be a significant number. Um, uh, and then marine life. Um, it's amazing how everything floating in, in water, how it attracts marine life, all kinds of marine life. 
uh, fisheries, they know that uh, to catch fish in open ocean, they use FEDS, federal fish aggregating devices. So basically rafts, they throw them in water and they come back one month later and they just collect fish around it. So, uh, and it, uh, you know, life, uh, uh, every piece is utilized by different form of life. Uh, this small cap is a home for small crab. Uh, this, uh, this is photographed through a, a hole in plastic container, and it's hard to see, but these are two coral fishes. They actually spend their entire life inside, and sometimes they cannot leave, but sometimes they, they refuse to leave when a plastic container is recovered. And, uh, of course, biofouling, barnacles, uh, it all creates kind of oasis of life uh, in, in the ocean. And once you get into something bigger, like this boat uh, washed uh, in, in the ocean during tsunami in Japan, uh, I will be talking about that tomorrow, uh, then you can see, immediately you can see around, around this boat, uh, bigger fish. Um, so... Uh, this biological interaction, it has many, many consequences. And, uh, of course, it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, re realizing active interaction with marine biota, it's, it's a bad news. It's, uh, it means that uh, impacts, even with small amount of plastic in the ocean, when it's targeted by marine life, impact can be, can be uh, significant. And impact uh, starts from mechanical impact, like um, entanglement, uh, entrap uh, entrapment, and then um, you probably uh, all, all heard these stories of seabirds uh, looking for uh, plastic fragments and feeding these fragments to, to, to uh, their cheeks. And, uh, and then uh, there are studies when uh, in the a fish pool in the laboratory, they show that if you add, if you start adding particle plastics, uh, and then uh, under, under some critical concentration, fish actually starts looking for them. Not just random encounters, but starts mistaking them for, for food. And, you know, my first thought was, okay, what, what a silly creatures. Uh, but no, 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 not that silly. The thing is, everything that falls in water uh, in very short time frame, few days, it, it becomes covered with biofilm. So it smells like candy, it tastes like candy, but, you know, there is something else inside. So they have reason to look for it. Um, and uh, then toxicity. So. Uh, most of plastic originally by itself, it's, it's not toxic. But what happens is for different purposes, we add some toxic materials, some toxic chemicals, for example, uh, for example fire retardants. And uh, in the beginning we think, oh yeah, it's safe to do because you know, these different types of plastic, they are on different shelves in our stores. But then later, years later in the ocean, it all mixes and uh, fish does not discriminate, or birds do not discriminate between toxic and non-toxic. In addition, some uh, plastic particles, they can also absorb toxins dissolved in uh, seawater. So now they can concentrate it in, in one point and become, become really poisonous. Um, uh, other, other impacts, yes, a threat to navigation and uh, uh, there are, I, I know, examples of uh, collisions with floating debris uh, uh, and, and tourism. Um, you know, like on, on the example of Mallorca during summertime, hotels here and in other places, they spend big resource, uh, resources to daily clean the beaches from debris. Otherwise, who will come? Uh, and one example, uh, in California, local government estimated uh, $30 million is spent by Californian citizens per year uh, just by driving extra distance to find clean, clean beach. Like you come to the beach, you don't like it, you go 
you try to find a better place. $30 million for nothing. Uh, and then uh, when talking about toxicity, so uh, once uh, it enters marine bi uh, biota, it enters food chain that basically leads to us, to humans. And as before I, I, I said, we all contribute to marine pollution, uh, to ocean pollution. This, this is the other end. We all suffer from ocean pollution, no matter where we live. Um, okay, so uh, we are we are good eye, good eye group. We are uh, about modeling and uh, observations. So uh, why why uh, our models uh, why our models have limitations in in uh, simulations of uh, drift surface drift? And to start with, uh, this is paper published by Jim Potemra, 2012. He just did very simple, straightforward work. He uh, took four excellent models, HICOM, ECHO, uh, ECMWF, SODA, and he averaged their solution over several years. And th then he used kind of mean velocities, and he launched particles uh, along these lines uh, just to show how, how they will converge uh, into the garbage patch area. And you can see that. Uh, well, some models, they behave kind of similar, but if you don't look into details, but uh, also the uh, model like HICOM, it, um, surprisingly, it behaves very differently. Um, and uh, just from, from this simulation, it's hard, hard to tell uh, which model is right, but probably uh, HICOM is, is a kind of outlier. And if you look uh, at the streamlines, time averaged, streamlines, then on the first look, uh, they are similar, same, same gyres, same uh, western boundary currents, same pattern of tropical currents, it's all there, but if you start looking into details, then uh, at the same location, if you put uh, velocity vectors at the same selected location, then you, you start seeing how they are fanning. Uh, and uh, why is that? Why is that? Uh, and also, um, uh, what, what, what are other problems associated with drift modeling? So, uh, in my view, main problem is that there are... Main problem is because we are trying to deal with a matter floating at the surface or near the surface. And numerical, our numerical models, they don't have power to resolve these small scales, vertical scales, and uh, they essentially kind of address dynamics integrated over some uh, layers. And you know, typical vertical resolution for OGCMs is like 10 meters. And uh, on that scale, on that scale, many things can happen. Actually, you can see how uh, uh, velocities at some selected location, how velocities uh, in the models and measured by, by drifters, how they are different between surface and 15 meters. And this is natural for such conceptual, uh, conceptual type of uh, ocean currents as uh, Ekman spiral. So uh, it already assumes that uh, uh, near the surface we have strong vertical shear, but in addition we have complexities that are not covered by our observations. For example, in tropics uh, there are observations when uh, in the beginning of next day, in the morning, new uh, solar heat, uh, it starts building up new buoyant layer, and, and uh, this buoyant layer, uh, and under weak wind, this buoyant layer, it's not mixed down, but under uh, uh, wind, weak wind, it becomes very slippery, and it can accelerate uh, up to uh, velocities, I think, up to 40 centimeters per second in this case. Of course, as, as time goes, uh, as it speeds up, as um, you know, uh, um, uh, turbulence makes, uh, does it work, and it mixes it down, so that uh, this momentum is spread over thicker layer, and surface velocities become weaker, but uh, this is part of the normal cycle. This is not what we uh, generally observe in our, um, uh, in our uh, observing system. Uh, another example of, of processes that are really tied to the very surface is Stokes drift, and here there were already some presentations, and uh, I saw some, some posters over there. And uh, in case of... Uh, drift simulations, some people do uh, 
uh, the following trick. They take velocities, uh, ocean currents and, uh, from uh, OGCM, and they take ocean winds from atmospheric model, and then they take Stokes drift from a wave model, and they add it all together, and they say they got nice results. Uh, I, my opinion, this is really desperate ad hoc measure that can, be, that can work in some occasions, but actually what it does, it breaks dynamical balance. So uh, the value of OGCM is that we understand dynamics based on you know, fundamental equations. If we, take it, uh, if we add uh, additional um, mass transport due to Stokes drift, we break, we simply break this dynamical balance. Even though we achieve, we may achieve in some cases uh, results that uh, seem working better. Uh, another example, um, of course, this is a more realistic view of the ocean. And another example of complexity of, uh, of the upper ocean. Um, in our models, usually we apply just uh, wind stress to flat surface, and we see. Uh, in reality, it's not flat, and actually, most of wind stress is applied to crests of waves. And uh, uh, under some kick, these heads of waves, wind waves, they can fall in water, and because upper ocean is homogeneous, uh, it was shown that they can penetrate as deep as 10 times of wave height. Now, look about this. Uh, uh, you've got kick from, from the wind, uh, water accelerates, uh, injects in the water, this is called momentum injection. It does not mix, it just penetrates, and then it mixes at some depth. And this all happens on time scales of seconds. We don't have models working with these time scales. This means, for correct description of this process, wind stress in our models should be applied below sea surface. It's kind of, kind of weird. Um, and after, after we, we, we succeed with uh, you know, uh, simulation of uh, 3D uh, surface currents, then we face another complexity. Different objects, due to their uh, geometry, due to their buoyancy, they drift differently under the same ocean and, and wind and wave conditions. So, um, uh, there are many groups working in uh, working trying to, to improve drift models. And um, I think one problem why we go slowly is because we don't have really good observations. Uh, our observations are very fragmentary, very gappy. So uh, it is uh, important for our modeling progress uh, uh, to also establish global observing system that can be uh, that can provide sufficient information uh, about uh, marine debris, about plastic debris, about object fl objects floating uh, on the uh, on the ocean surface, and this should include both in situ observations and important uh, remote remote sensors and process of development. It should be strongly coupled with uh, models that. Uh, I expect it to help optimize uh, the strategy of observation. And working in, in the direction of uh, remote sensing of marine debris, uh, last year we had workshops sponsored by NASA. This is Eric Lindstrom, physical oceanography. And uh, this year I'm happy to, uh, to share with you this good news. Uh, last year uh, ESA uh, had competition for RESMALI, program, which is remote sensing of marine litter, and they selected several projects, and now these projects are activated. So uh, we are living really, really exciting time. And uh, my last slide. So, um, okay, we have this problem. We, we, we should do something. So what can we do? And uh, different, peop different you know, layers of our society, different groups, uh, they see different solutions. And um, like enforcement, if we cannot stimulate people, if we cannot conv convince people, then we should uh, enforce some laws, and such as uh, single-use free plastic bags enforced in uh, some states. Uh, then uh, it would be uh, a breakthrough if real environmental cost would be added uh, to, to, to the price of plastic from the very beginning. Then it would 
change you know, rules of, of the game. Uh, some, some countries, uh, they introduce rewards. For example, in Korea, uh, fishermen returning from the ocean uh, used uh, nets, fishing nets. They receive money. Uh, this can be somebody's, somebody's nets. If you find it, you return it, and uh, you get money from uh, your government. And uh, these uh, people say this works. Uh, and then uh, there are ideas for a uh, new type of material, such as uh, PHA polymers that are uh, produced not from oil, but from uh, organic material. Uh, and uh, also it degrades uh, much faster than, than oil-based uh, uh, plastic. But we need to be careful. We need to be careful um, because uh, it needs to be studied bec before it's really implemented. And then education. This is, uh, I would say, this is very long shot. It's very difficult to change people's habit. And one uh, strange way how education works is when politicians hear about this problem from their children and gr grandchildren. And um, this is kind of uh, surprisingly good, good effect. And in the end, this is what, what we should do, I believe. Uh, uh, the entire problem, in my view, it started with the lack of our understanding. We didn't know what will be the effect of this new material. And uh, understanding better these impacts, understanding better its life cycle distribution, establishing uh, observing systems that uh, can control the state of, of the pollution. It's not only for today's plastic. We are inventing new materials. We are inventing uh, nanomaterials. What to expect from them? So we need to learn how to live on this small planet, understanding what, what we are doing. Thank you very much.